everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and I'm here today with an experiment. I want to see if we set up a cool vat using the same colors, the same yarn base, starting with dry yarn all around, if we can create something that feels more tonal, if we're dyeing a twisted skein, versus if we just have the yarn here in the container, which is just a plastic shoebox. So that's what we are gonna be working on today. Now, the yarn came in these beautiful twisted skeins. I'm not going to dye it in this form. I will retwist it into a looser twist, but we will see. So the yarn we're dyeing today is Dyer Supplier Superwash Sport Merino. This yarn is 100% Superwash Merino, and I'm curious how many plies it has. Like a lot of the other bases, this yarn is three ply, and while I technically have not dyed it before, I am excited to try. Now, the two skeins that are gonna be untwisted, I am using some already dark zip ties. And the two skeins that I'm gonna twist, I'm gonna use two lighter ones. And so I am going to place on the zip tie. I love using these reusable nylon zip ties. They're 12 inches long and I use them in many projects. If you wanna learn more about any of the tools or equipment that I'm using, you can find affiliate links down in the video description. So I have this in a much looser, loftier twist. You can see the difference in the size. And this is gonna fit really well in the container. I could do it from the commercially twisted yarn, but we're gonna do it this way. And we will heat set the yarn at the end. Uh, this is just to allow the color to absorb. So one difference in here is that eh, I guess the crowdedness will feel very similar. So we're gonna have a lot of water in here, add the dye, I guess we'll see what we can get. But I guess I'm gonna fill them up to about this line. All right, we've got approximately 12 cups of water in each tub. And now I'm gonna add two tablespoons of white vinegar to each tub as well. This is fairly low acid wise. Uh, let's go ahead and add one more. Okay, now we're at three tablespoons of white vinegar per tub, and this is the proportion that I use the most. For our dye today, I'm gonna use a 1% stock solution of Dharma Silver Gray, and I'm gonna add 200 uh, milliliters of this dye stock to each container, which would be a total of two grams of dye in each container. So we're aiming for approximately a 1% depth of shade on the yarn because each tub will have 200 grams of yarn and two dyes per 200 grams of yarn is a 1% depth of shade. All right, let's add the dye. First, I'm going to shake up the stock. And how old is this? Uh, not that old couple months so I'm measuring in a graduated beaker which is fairly approximate I considered doing this project with black but I didn't want the color to be too saturated that it could be harder to see a difference. And this proportion of gray should be perfect for seeing more and less saturated colors on our yarn. So let's start here. The one thing I don't know is because I haven't dyed this yarn before, I'm not sure how absorbent it is. I know that something like Swish DK sucks up water really quickly. I'm hoping that this yarn will but we will have to see. If you want more even color coverage, starting with pre-soaked yarn is the best way to go. Starting with dry yarn will typically give you more tonal variation, and I'm okay with some tonal variation in here. I love tonal variation. Now the main difference between what I'm gonna do today and the last time I tried this project is that I'm not planning on untwisting our twisted skeins. So I'm gonna leave that. I will press on it more in 
a little bit. The twisted skeins, luring them in. And when I did this before, I didn't press on them very much, but then I untwisted them after a period of time. I want to press on these enough so that way they soak up liquid. And we can get those air bubbles out. I'm not sure how long I'm going to leave everything to sit. The one concern about squeezing the yarn is that if this is going to help the yarn suck in color everywhere, uh, then we might lose some of the benefit of having the resist. But I am trying to keep or at least treat all the yarn as similarly as I can. Uh, at least here at the beginning. And yeah, there's definitely bits that are still dry. This does not absorb water as fast. You can see like there, there's some like individual spots. Given that this is gonna effectively be a pre-soak, um, we, should see some of that even out, at least I hope. But I just want to point out, we're soaking up a lot of that color already. It is already significantly, significantly less pigmented than what we had when we started. So what I'm doing now is mostly checking for dry patches. By doing a cool vet technique, overall, you allow yourself to get more even coverage, um, <laughs> assuming it, starting with, if we started with pre-soaked yarn, we would be able to get more even coverage. Sometimes I might put it in before even adding vinegar. Uh, we might be uneven just because this did not soak up liquid that fast, but that's okay. So what I'm anticipating we might see here is that we might see some deeper color overall because there's less surface area available. Um, but if we look here, same amount of acid, see how much more pigment is in here right, right now? Now granted, I think I've manipulated this yarn a little bit less so far. So what I'm doing right now is sort of pushing it against the bottom to really make sure that it's saturated. And I will say, right now when I'm seeing, this does look like it is more saturated than what I'm seeing over here. Where, <laughs> oh my goodness, almost everything has absorbed. Oh my gosh. I mean, this one I'm almost completely ready to go and uh, <laughs> steam set. Oh my gosh, that is so wild and fast. And even just like moving this through, a reason why it's slower is just because of the limited access of the fiber to the yarn. So this isn't like the same amount of movement, but that will be more even than this. I think no matter how I slice, however we slice it, and we do see some huge differences right away. So now what I'm going to do is, hmm, there's a tiny bit of pigment in there. I'm actually going to give it to that one. It's a couple drops, not a huge difference. Uh, and now I'm going to cover these and we're going to let them sit probably at, at least overnight and if not then at least a couple of days. Now I could have done this in two kettles side by side but the main difference is that if these were in kettles then we know we would see more variation. I love dyeing twisted stains to get variegated yarn. So anyway. I'm gonna set these aside, and then in a couple of days, we'll come back and check. It's almost 24 hours later, so let's peek in on the yarn. Now, I definitely see uh, color left in here with our twisted hanks. Let's look at our more just open. That is pretty much cleared in just 24 hours. I would be 
more than comfortable calling this one done, I would go steam set this and move on. As for our twisted skeins, there is, it's almost a reddish purplish hue left over. I don't want to peek in or move things too much, but uh, we're close to now where we were here almost immediately after adding the yarn. So it's going to take more time, but we will check in in another couple days. But we can be we can be confident that things might progress further because slowly we are seeing less and less color here in the pan. It's another day later and checking in on our twisted skeins, there's still some pigment in here, but almost all of it is in the yarn. In fact, it looked really clear until I just moved it. So I'm not sure if I'm going to steam it today or if I'm going to wait one more day. Uh, but just in contrast, I'm sure that this one is going to look, oh, you can't even see. There we go. Compl pretty completely clear. So I will wait at least a couple more hours just because I need space on the stovetop to steam things. Uh, but I am really, really excited and the depth of color on our twisted skeins is so much darker than the other and I'm just very intrigued and excited. It is now day three and let's check in. We know that our untwisted yarn is clear but just another confirmation and as for our twisted, oh this one looks like it started to get untwisted. It is almost clear in enough that I'm going to lift it up and see. Ooh, ooh, we got some good, you can see some good tonal variation. I'm actually now putting this in because if we will quickly soak up any residual before I go steam this, then that would not be something I'd be sad about. <laughs> So what I'm going to do now is, uh, this isn't going to sit for about five minutes, I'm going to go set up my steamer basket. Clearly, we now have the potential to have a batch setup of the technique I love that's a twisted skein three times. Um, this tonal is actually awesome. Uh, we got some good variation in here, likely because we had a really small volume of water in here. And I also didn't stir things that often. So I love the results there. The results here are awesome as well. I think that maybe with higher acid and starting with wet yarn so it just goes in, we could cool that set up this technique so that way it would streamline the whole process and make it go faster. And by faster, I suppose I mean like each day you could then retwist and put it in a new color versus um, waiting for the yarn to cool which is the harder is a harder thing and so I'll pop in front of the camera to talk about speed and streamlining but there's a hint of color left with our twisted but almost all of it is in the yarn so I'm gonna go steam set this for 30 minutes when I'm talking about speed right now, I'm speaking as a small batch indie dyer who has limited space on their stovetop. So for example, I have four burners on my stovetop, which means I have a limit to the number of projects I can be heating at any given time. But if there's something that I can quickly set up and then let it sit overnight, followed by a quick steam, that is something I can streamline to then take advantage of more yarn versus having something on the stove, heating and cooling over the span of hours. And so it means that it's taking less time on my stovetop and it's faster because I'm able to do more dyeing projects at once, if that makes any sense. This is a reason why I like doing this cool vat kind of technique when I'm doing a lot of samples or swatches. It just makes things, it makes it a little easier to process everything uh, because then I can heat more of the samples at once. Something I could do that would speed things up even faster is if 
you do a cool vat approach followed by the microwave. Because when I microwave yarn, you only need to microwave it for around four minutes total. And then it takes a long time to cool. But again, that's something else that would speed up your processing speed, I suppose, coming. And if you're trying to dye more yarn, working out of a small studio or home kitchen or something, this is something that can help you speed things up. However, I do want to add that personally, I don't put acid dyes in my microwave. I have a like installed microwave that's up high. It's harder to clean. So it'd be harder for me to clean any spills. So personally, I would invest in an inexpensive dedicated dye microwave if that was an approach I was going to follow moving forward. But it's fun to see how many techniques beyond just, you know, a tonal or maybe a variegated wrapped up in some plastic wrap or something we can set, which actually I haven't done that as a cool that kind of thing yet. But it's fun to see the variety of different things we can do with this cool technique because especially as the weather warms up and we head into summer and I can really leave things outside without a risk of freezing that opens us up to more possibilities to create and I'm then less limited by my stovetop. There are ways for indie dyers who do small batches to set things up without one stove. Some people will get uh, steam tables like you would see at a buffet or something like that to heat yarn. And there's even proofing cabinets that are used for helping bread rise. I'm not sure if they can also bake the bread, but those are something else that uh, a lot of dyers will use because you can stack pans up and let them heat and cool. And so that might take a longer time overall, but if you can have hundreds of skeins in there at any given time, then it all works out. So that's not something that I am, I have the space or the ability to invest in, but maybe someday if I'm ever able to build a studio, those are things that I would like to include. I just finished steaming the yarn for 30 minutes. Oh. <laughs> we are very, very steamy up in here. And now I'm going to let the yarn cool off completely so we can go and wash it. But there's undoubtedly a huge difference between them. Let's wash our cool that yarn that then we steam set. And I'm really excited to look at these side by side and see the difference of the tones and get a sense of the balance. But I'm so glad that this worked so well. I am not seeing any color bleeding. Let's go ahead and add just some generic dish soap. I always wash with cool tap water and sometimes you can see some bleeding with soap, but I am not seeing any today. Uh, I, I like to do the soap test on camera. Uh, it just can help remove, sometimes there's some residue or things that you need to remove. But anyway, I'm really happy. So I'm now going to rinse this probably two more times to rinse out that soap, put the yarn through my spin dryer and hang everything up to dry. I am so impressed with how this turned out. I wasn't sure how much color penetration, how patchy things would feel from our twisted skeins, but we've got some areas that almost look glazed where the color feels so shallow and the, the balance of this yarn is really good. Yes, there's areas that have more light and more dark, but that seems to be pretty random throughout the whole skein. and. I'm thrilled. I want to explore this more in the future. This really opens up possibilities for scaling up some colorways uh, when you have limited stove space, as I discussed previously. I'm also really impressed with the way that these tonals have turned out. In the past, I've used this cool vat technique more to create more even coverage. And so getting something with less even coverage is exciting. And also, I'm now really paying attention to the effects that having acid really does to the color. Having acid does cause some colors to start striking really quickly. So I think that the level of acid makes more of a difference for your coverage than the heat that you have. But 
Anyway, uh, I love this for tonals and I'm sure over the course of this year I will be doing a lot of cool that type things. It definitely took longer and we definitely have high contrast here, but I now have some ideas of how I can modify this to bring us somewhere between these two. The first time I tried doing a cool that on a twisted skein, I didn't leave the yarn in there very long. And maybe there wasn't that much acid there either. So I think that a combination of adding the acid, leaving the twisted skein in maybe even overnight and then opening it up when there's really not much pigment left, that could give us something slightly more subtle here. Or even we wait for the most of the dye to absorb and then put it in a new bath and over dye it to add, like I guess if you combine the two of these, you'll have this variation, but it'll be more subtle overall. It all depends on what you're going for. And man, Re future Rebecca, try some of these ideas out. I am just really excited to push this further and explore more. Even though we have the exact same amount of dye, we have different levels of saturation at the more saturated points. And that's just because we did not add the dye evenly all over this yarn. So we were able to get darker patches. If you want to have the darkest patch be similar to what you have in that tonal, you might need to do a little bit of trial and error because it would be hard to do that with a strict calculation uh, because I don't know how to look at this and tell you what depth of shade that is. Although I suppose if you have mini skeins, uh, if you do mini skeins at different depths of shade, you can then take those to compare. So then you can calculate uh, what depth of shade you would need to get this color on that yarn. But that's another idea for the future too, <laughs> to back figure out the depth of shade on a tonal to make a semi-solid that coordinates. You could absolutely describe both of these colorways as tonal. Uh, this has a really high contrast tonal and this is one much more subtle. I feel like when I dye tonals, I tend to go for something like this, where the differences in pigment are subtle. Those types of yarn work so, so well for complex stitch patterns and giving a bit of depth because the change in color doesn't distract you from cables or lace or whatever it is you are creating. This is a bit louder, um, but still not as loud as uh, some colorways I've created in the last few months. I am so thrilled with all of the yarn and I really hope that you enjoyed this experiment. I think that this video is a great example of how I'll try something, maybe the results aren't as awesome as I had hoped, but then maybe you should try it again and tweak things a little bit. At some point I might move on because I'll be inspired by a different technique or dye or yarn or something, but it's really fun to follow these threads and I really appreciate all of you supporting the Dye Pot Weekly series because this is my exploration of adding color to yarn and the different ways that we can do that. And my hope is that either I can be providing entertainment for you or I can inspire you with how you might wanna start your yarn dyeing journey and encourage you to explore and experiment and play with color. Because ultimately, every indie dyer has the techniques that they love and techniques that they don't love as much. And Color and preferences like that are so personal. And so ultimately you will find that you might love a technique that I hate or vice versa. And that is so okay. But exploring and figuring that out, what works best for you is so much fun. If you enjoy this content and approach, please subscribe to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel. There are at least two videos every week and I'm constantly continuing to try new things. and. I think if you go back and watch from the beginning of the series, when I first started trying with acid, trying to dye yarn with acid dyes, or even the food coloring, which I was really comfortable with using back then, I feel like I have grown so much as a dyer because I continue to push and try and 
improve and vary the techniques that I'm using. This isn't to say that you have to go outside the box and do things that are really, really wild, but when you find what you like and you find your comfort zone, maybe tweak it a little bit because then you'll discover something that works best for you. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and thank you so much for watching.